I'll go home. Okay. So, thank you, honey. That was great. Very uh, relevant message for tonight's message, actually. Um, tonight's message was originally entitled, A Thousand Years of Peace. And I took the liberty of changing the title only because uh, a thousand years of peace can be a little deceptive when it comes to this subject, and I'm going to show you why here in just a little bit. Um, but evil in chains, who do you think the person in chains is? Satan himself. And we're going to find out in the Bible here in just a minute uh, what that means. But before we do that, I had just another quick prayer, and then we're going to get right into the study. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with the privilege of being here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to not only serve you, but uh, to join you in your work. And we just ask that you will please join us now as we continue in this special time together this evening. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the book of Revelation, as we have discovered throughout our time together, there are some things in the book of Revelation and Daniel that maybe have shocked you a little bit when you've heard them. Uh, maybe you've had to go home and kind of stew over them for just a little bit. Uh, tonight is another one of those subjects because there, are, there is some confusion on what the millennium is and what it is not. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is we're going to talk about what it is and what it isn't. And I'm going to share with you what the worldview is of the millennium. And then I'm going to share with you what the biblical view of the millennium is. And I'm going to let you decide which one you're going to accept. Okay, well, let, let's, uh, let's present the evidence first. And then you can decide which one you're going to accept. So before we actually get started in our uh, subject tonight on the millennium, I just want to share uh, a little illustration with you. Let's just imagine that you were an explorer on a barren Arctic island, and your supplies were rapidly running out, you hadn't eaten anything in a long time, and your fuel supply was low. The temperature was dropping fast. You were preparing for the worst because you knew that it was about to come. However, looking over the horizon, you see a glimmer of hope, a plume of smoke rising in the air. And just when you thought there was no more hope left, that glimmer of hope was out there on the horizon. And it gave you just enough confidence to think to yourself, you know what, I am not going to die on this island. The puff of smoke on the horizon was enough to encourage you to say, you know what, let's go ahead, and even though we are in the worst of situations, let's just accept in our minds that somebody is coming to save us. Now, what's that? Yeah, but the illustration that I want to make is this one right here. So imagine that we are on a planet where we are filled with dread, we are filled with despair, we are filled with all kind of evil things that are going on around us, and the only shred of hope that we have is Jesus Christ. He is that plume of smoke on the horizon, and you and I have to accept that not only is He wanting to come and get us, but He is wanting us to want Him to come and get us. So even though we are marred by sin, and even though we are looking forward to His promises, that day has not yet come. But we do know from what the Bible says that that day is coming. Would you agree? And when that day comes, there are going to be some that are going to be very, very happy, and there's going to be some that are going to be very, very disappointed. And so let's go ahead as we 
look at what is going to be coming upon this earth, let's just remember that Jesus is already extending his arm to us to come save us from this wretched planet that we live on. So, in the Bible, uh, we know that there is going to be a second coming. We talked about that. We know what that second coming is going to look like. We know that there is not anything that we would call a secret rapture. In other words, when the rapture happens, which just means to be caught up in the air, it means that everybody is going to see that. Would you agree? Based on what we've learned, we know that there is nothing in Scripture that says that there are going to be people here or there, and people are just going to miraculously disappear, and nobody's going to know about anything because it's a secret. We know that it's going to be audible. We know that it's going to be visible. We know that it's going to be literal. And we know that it's going to be um, uh, gl global. So everybody is going to see. And we're all going to be caught up, not all, but there are going to be those who are going to be caught up. And who are those people? Those are the ones that are righteous, whether they be dead or whether they be living. Those are the ones that are going to be caught up into the air to meet Jesus in the air because the Bible tells us that Jesus will not what? And this is important. This is why I'm emphasizing this. Jesus will not step foot where? On the earth. And so when we look at the worldview of what the millennium is, that is important to remember that. So we will receive the reward of eternal life or Satan and his followers will receive the reward of eternal damnation. Now, when we look at court's uh, hearings, normally a light sentence is given to somebody who has committed a crime that is not so gruesome, right? But the strictest and the longest and the most dramatic uh, of consequences are dealt to those who have committed some of the most grievous crimes. Now, can you think of anybody in the conflict of good and evil who has committed grievous crimes? Satan himself has committed grievous crimes. So if Satan himself has committed grievous crimes, do you think that God has in store for him a penalty or a punishment that is going to fit the crime? Absolutely, he does. So let's go ahead, as we look at this subject of the millennium, let's go ahead and start by looking at Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. And it says this, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him so that he should, re he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So before we go any further, there are a couple things that I just want to back up, and I just want to ask you. So it says here that there was an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. That word bottomless pit is actually the word abusos or abyss, and it means uh, the state of nothingness is what that word means. We go back to the Old Testament, we see that in the same word is used in, in the creation where it says the earth was without form and void. It's the same, not the same word, but it's the same uh, concept of nothingness. So the, the, the world was nothing before God created it into something, Amen. And it says, he laid hold of the dragon, who is the devil, right, Satan. And it says he bound him. What does it mean to be bound? Right, in other words, you're not, you're not going to be able to do whatever that you have been doing for all these years. Something is going to change. And your circumstances are going to be dramatically different than they are right now. And he was cast into the abusos, or the abyss, or the bottomless pit, or the nothingness, and shut him up and set a seal on him, so that he should what? Deceive the nations no more until when? Until the thousand years were finished. So what does this tell us? Before we go any further, this is basically telling us, before we get into any of the study, is that 
God has got reserved for our enemy, Satan, a place where he is going to be bound because of what he has done for all of these years, and he is not going to be able to tempt anybody for a period of a thousand years. Now, is that a penalty that you believe fits the crime? That he's not going to have anybody? What has he done all these years? He's tempted people, hasn't he? Imagine not being able to tempt anybody for a thousand years if you're a tempter. Right? So, we're going to go ahead and take a look at this. But it tells us that he will be imprisoned for a thousand years. That is going to be the first part of his punishment. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the word millennium means, because the word millennium um, is a a word that's made up of two Latin words, milli meaning 1,000 and annum meaning a year. Okay, so uh, we just need to make sure we understand what this word means, because this word millennium, there's actually four worldviews that we get from this word millennium in the Bible. And by the way, the worldviews that I'm about to share with you are not worldviews that are based on Scripture. They're actually based on presuppositional ideas that people have regarding uh, what we call eschatology or the study of end-time events. So if your study of end-time events begins in the wrong place, where will the study of your end-time events lead you? To the wrong place. Now, How do we know what the right place is and how do we know what the wrong place is? Well, if we do line up, remember all the things I'm sharing with you, we've heard already, right? So we do line upon line, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept, right? And we are faithful to God's word. Are we going to be able to start in the right place? Absolutely, we will be able to start in the right place. So now let me go ahead and share with you the four worldviews that we, and some of these are actually kind of combined, but I'm going to read all four of them for you just to give you an idea of what they are. Okay, so millennialism is the first worldview. It is from uh, the meaning of a thousand years, or Chileism. I've got to put my glasses on to read this. These words are kind of small. It's a belief advanced by some religious denominations that a golden age or paradise will occur where? On earth, prior to the final judgment and the future eternal state of the world to come. So right now, there should be some red flags. What's the first red flag that we see in this, in this worldview? Well, first of all, it says there's going to be a thousand years of peace before a judgment. And it also says that there... Um, that it's going to be an age, a golden age or a paradise that will come here on the earth. And it will be a thousand years long. Now, to sort of expand on that, let's look at premillennialism. Because premillennialism tells us that um, it's a Christian eschatology or a study of end time events. Which is a belief that Jesus will physically return to where? The earth. Now, what do we know about his return? Is he going to touch the ground when he comes back the second time? Yeah, he was already here once. Yeah. So his second coming, is he going to touch the ground? Okay. So before the millennium, heralding a literal thousand-year golden age of peace. Premillennialism is based upon a literal interpretation of Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6 in the New Testament, which describes <clears throat> Jesus' reign in a period of a thousand years. So what is the problem that we have with this? Well, the problem we have with this is it's a, actually a combination between this worldview and the previous worldview that Jesus is going to actually a, a descend to the earth and he is going to set up an earthly kingdom that's going to last for a thousand years and it's going to be a peaceful time of paradise and, and bliss. Let's look at the third worldview. The third worldview is it's a Christian eschatology or end time theology a post-millennialism or post uh, millenarianism It's an interpretation of chapter 20 of the book of Revelation which sees Christ's second coming as occurring after the millennium, a golden age in which Christian ethics prosper. Now, before I even read the rest of that definition for you, is it possible for ethics to prosper 
in a place where Jesus does not exist? Is it possible for us to have our own ethical behavior expand to the point where everything is almost perfect before Jesus comes? Are we ever going to live in a world where people are going to be able to get their acts together, where we're going to have all kind of morality and all kind of ethical behavior? That's a trick question, by the way. But let me just read the rest of this. Post-millennialism holds that Jesus Christ establishes his kingdom on the earth through his preaching and redemptive work in the first century and that he equips his church with the gospel, empowers the church by the Spirit, and charges the church with the Great Commission to disciple all nations. Now, let me ask you something. Does the last part of that sound like what's going on right now? I mean, didn't he give us the gospel? He gave the church the gospel. He empowered the church by the Spirit. He charges this church with the Great Commission to disciple and what? Baptize all nations. Right, but, but what is the purpose for doing all of that? The purpose for doing all of that is to get people prepared for the second coming. Okay, so this whole thousand years of bliss that takes place and this uh, millennialism that I shared with you earlier and the premillennialism which I share with you, all three of these combined are not really much different from the other. But here's the one that ties them all together, which is what almost every Christian in the world, save Seventh-day Adventists and maybe a few others, believe. So here's what they believe. It's called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, and, and by the way, I shared this back when we talked about uh, the origin of evil and when we talked about um, the 70-week prophecy. We touched on that just a little bit. Well, dispensationalism is the belief that uh, it, it's an interpreting the Bible that was first espoused by John N Nelson Darby. Dispensationalism maintains that history is divided into multiple ages, ages or dispensations in which God acts with humanity in different ways. Now, here's the kicker. Dispensationalists generally maintain beliefs in premillennialism, a future, a future restoration of Israel and a rapture that will happen before the second coming, generally seen as happening before the tribulation. There's all kind of messed up stuff in there. But this is the worldview that almost every Christian has in regards to eschatology, in, 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 in regards to the end time of what's going to happen at the end of time. So my question for you tonight is, do you want to know what the Bible says about the millennium? Because, or we can just stop right now, and we can say, you know what? We'll just accept one of these four views, and, and, and we'll go home. We can, just, we can end early. Do you all want to know what the Bible says? Okay, let's look at what the Bible says. So in order to understand this prophecy of the millennium, we need to find out, how it starts, and how it ends. Is there, a book, is there a bookend on either side of the millennium? I would like to suggest to you that definitely there is a bookend on either side of the millennium. But before I show you what that is, let me ask you a question. How many resurrections do we find in Scripture? Okay, don't think too hard. I'm not going to make you answer that question. How many resurrections, though? I'm going to ask a different question now. Yeah, there, there, was, there, was, there were several resurrections, but the, the resurrections that we want to talk about tonight are the ones that are associated with the millennium and have to do with salvation and judgment. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. The resurrection of life is at the beginning of the millennium. Okay, you remember when Jesus comes down from heaven? And uh, we read in Thessalonians where it says that he is going to come down with the shout of an archangel and the dead in Christ are going to rise. And then those who are alive and remain are going to be caught up in the air with Jesus. That is the resurrection that is on the one side of the millennium. What is on the other side of the millennium? The resurrection of damnation at the end of the millennium. 
So you have the resurrection of life that goes to the righteous. You have a thousand year period of time. And then you have the resurrection of those who are wicked, who died at the, com- at, at the, at the uh, brightness of Jesus coming um, or stayed dead in the ground until this third coming of Jesus. So now I just gave my, my second question answer away. I was going to ask you, how many uh, comings of Jesus are there? Well, there's a, there was the first coming. When was the first coming? Right, but I mean, how many are there in the Bible, though? So you have the, Jesus came, right? He's been here already. Is there, an, is, there, does he, is there a second coming? Okay, is there a third coming? Right, but the, ones we're, the only ones we're going to focus on tonight are the ones about salvation and judgment. That's all we're focusing on tonight. So, but yes, there are several other ones. Uh, one happens to be Lazarus. One also happens to be the first fruits that resurrected when Jesus was resurrected from the grave. You remember that? So, but let's go ahead and, and look and see how the Bible describes these uh, resurrections. John chapter 5, verse 25 says this. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So, who is Jesus talking about here when he says, those who are dead will hear and live? Okay, so the the righteous who have died, and then we also know that the righteous who are alive will also be not resurrected, but they will, be, um, they will be caught up in the air. He says that all the dead one day will hear his voice and be raised from the dead, whether they be righteous, <clears throat> would you hear that? Whether they be righteous or whether they be wicked. But right now we're just focusing on the righteous. Let's go ahead and look at John chapter 5, verse 28. It says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which... All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Continuing on, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and then here's the other one, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, I am hoping that all of you are hoping the same thing that I'm hoping, and that is that when Jesus comes, and he comes with that loud shout, the voice of the archangel, I am hoping that I am going to be one of the ones that either comes up out of the grave or is translated and is caught up in the air with Jesus. Is that what you're hoping for? That is what I'm hoping for. But unfortunately, unfortunately, there are going to be some who are not going to be a part of that group. And um, I'm not saying that flippantly, and I'm not saying that because I I, I don't care about those people. I, I think we all care that everybody who has an opportunity to be saved can be saved. Would you agree? And there are people, though, who choose, like we choose to follow Jesus, and we, we do it because we love him, and um, we want to do what honors him. There are some people who choose not to love him, and at the same time will choose not to obey him. And unfortunately, those are going to be the ones that are going to be a part of that second resurrection. Um, that we are actually the third resurrection, but it's, it's the second resurrection in the context of what we're studying tonight. So the first resurrection is what? Let's go over this again. The first resurrection is the resurrection of the righteous, and the second resurrection after the millennium is the resurrection of the, the wicked. Okay, and we're going to talk, we're going to see what that looks like here in just a minute. So the two resurrections that we have, those who've done good and those who have done evil, Uh, Let's go ahead and look in Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in which one? The first one. So is there a blessing to be a part of the second one? No. There is a blessing to be a part of the first one. Why is there a blessing? Well, the next verse tells us. It says, over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and continuing on, and shall reign with him for how long? A thousand years. 
Now, before we go any further about where this reigning is going to take place, let's just do some logical conclusions here for just a moment. When Jesus comes back, this is something we've studied already, when Jesus comes back, he comes in the clouds, and he comes down with a loud voice, and who comes up out of the ground? The righteous dead, and then those who are alive and remain, who are the righteous, they ended up going to meet Jesus in the air. And where does it say the righteous go after they meet Jesus in the air? They go with, well, it says that they go with him. Where, where is he going? He's going back to where he came from, right? So it, it kind of begs the question, if it says that we shall reign with him for a thousand years, based just on that evidence alone that I just shared with you, where will the reigning take place? Wherever Jesus is, right? And if Jesus hasn't touched the ground, how do we reign with Jesus for a thousand years on earth like the dispensationalists believe? You see where I'm getting at? You see why these worldviews are kind of dangerous? Because if you don't read the Scripture and you don't understand where Jesus is when he's doing stuff, then you're going to start off in the wrong place when it comes to eschatology, which means you're going to end up in the wrong place. So let's go ahead and continue on, because here's that text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses, uh, starting in verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So what did it say? It says we will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. And then it says we shall be with him always. Excuse me just a second. <clears throat> Well, actually, when does the judgment take place? That's a good thing. That's a, thank you for saying that. So if the reward is eternal life or, the return, or, the, or your reward is eternal condemnation, when does judgment have to take place? It has to take place before you receive your reward. So when would the judgment have had to have taken place for the righteous? Before... Jesus' second coming. Because when does Jesus give the reward to the righteous? At his second coming. Okay? And then we're going to find out, and this is very important, thank you for mentioning that, because there is an investigation that's going to take place. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but we're going to talk about that in just a minute. There is an investigation that's going to take place so that we can see that God is a just God. And that he would not arbitrarily just say, you know what, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost, and you're lost. Everybody who is lost, everybody who receives eternal condemnation, receives it because that's what they chose. Not because God just de decides to be a tyrant. He doesn't work that way. So here's how Jesus works, right here, this next text. John eleven twenty five. 25. He who believes in me or puts their trust and confidence in me and does the things that I share with them, Though he may die, he shall live. Now, what death is this talking about? We're going to all, I mean, it's, it's very highly likely that if Jesus does not come in our lifetime, we are going to have experienced the first death. Would you agree with that? We're all going to die that physical death. But what is the death that we don't want to die? We don't want to die a spiritual death. Because if we die a spiritual death, then we might be labeled with or be a part of that group that is not going to raise again until after the millennium. You understand? So you will notice that the dead in Christ will be raised first, and then his followers um, of Jesus who are alive, they will be caught up later. We've already uh, studied that. And then it says um, in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19, it says, Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust and the earth shall cast out the dead. 
So um, what, what kind of a glorious day is it going to be when you start seeing people coming up out of the dirt? You know, I've always wondered what that was going to look like. You know, I've always said, I want to live around a, a cemetery at, at the second coming of Jesus. But you know what? We don't need to. You want to know why? Right, but, but, even, but even if you're not living next to like a cemetery, like a physical cemetery like we are right there, there's a physical cemetery, of course you might see people coming up out of the dirt. But you know what's going to even be as impressive? Seeing righteous people floating in the air to meet Jesus. Because either way, you're either going to be coming up out of the ground floating in the air to, to see Jesus or to be with Jesus, or you're going to be alive and moving around and Jesus is going to catch us up into the air. So either way, it's going to be amazingly phenomenal. What do you think? Can't wait for that day. And, and people are going to be reunited, sons and daughters reunited with their moms and dads, so on and so forth, husbands. Now, I don't know how, I don't know exactly what that day is going to look like and, and exactly how we're going to remember everybody. All I can tell you is that it's going to be much better than what we have right now. Would you agree? We just have to trust in what Jesus says. He says, look, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where does Jesus want us to spend the millennium? In the ground, laying on top of the ground with the birds have eaten us up, or with him wherever he is? Jesus wants us to spend the millennium with him wherever he is. Now, we already have established where he's not. We already established that he's not on the ground because the Bible has not spoken any time of Jesus touching the ground while the resurrected righteous have, have been caught up in the air. It says that he will not touch the ground. Yes, sir. Well, it's, it's amazing that you asked me that question. Like, I already knew you were going to ask me that because I have the slides in here to show you the answer to the question. So, if you hold on just a few moments, I'm going to answer your question. I, I know what you meant. Yeah. So, let's go ahead and take a look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. And it says this. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. Now listen to the language very carefully here. And I saw thrones, and they, and, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death, which is the spiritual death, or eternal death, has no power. But they shall be priests of God and, Christ, and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Now, did you see how the beginning of this, these few texts started? Let me go back and show you. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Just remember that, okay? We're not going to talk about that a whole lot right this second, but just hold that in your mind for just a minute. Now let's go ahead, um, when, we, when we look at this powerful God of the, the universe, how many people does he want to include in making sure that we know that the way he has done things is in accordance with what he has described himself to be to us as we've lived here on the earth? Wouldn't it be nice to know that if he has described himself to be a just and a righteous God, wouldn't it be nice to know that he is a just and a righteous God? Do you think that he cares enough to show us the evidence that he is a just and a righteous God? 
Yeah, sure. So let's go ahead and continue on. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3 say, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, Kevin. This is getting a little too deep for me. Just hold on. Just hold on. We're going somewhere with this. So the first text we read about four slides ago says that they were sitting on thrones and judgment was what? Committed to them. Then it says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And do you not know that they shall judge angels? Now, I don't want you to get wrapped around the world, the word judge there. You had a question? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're going to get to that. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, we're not talking about, you know, like named saints from the church. We're talking about people who have accepted Christ as their Savior. They've walked in His ways. They were found righteous, and they were resurrected to eternal life. Those are the saints that we're talking about. Yeah, why don't, why don't you guys let me present this, and then maybe by the time that I'm done, you'll, you'll understand uh, what all this means, okay? So, um, through the, the, so let me ask you another question. Do you want God to be transparent with you and me? What if he were not transparent? What kind of a God would we be serving if he were not? So if he is transparent, then everyone will have the opportunity, right, to see what a just and loving God he is and how honest he is. So for thousands of years, who has been attacking us? Satan, our enemy, has been attacking us. He has claimed that God is selfish. He has claimed that nobody can follow God because his ways are just, they're just too hard, right? Right? They're too demanding. Obedience and worship are just, it's just too much for people. But the thousand years will provide an opportunity for the saved to see behind the scenes and examine God's interactions with every person and angel who is lost. It's an opportunity for God's character and the dealings, for his dealings to be full, transparent, and on display. So let's go ahead, and we're going to start breaking this down. All the questions that have been asked, the comments that have been made, we're going to start breaking all this down. First of all, before we go there, Revelation 16, verse 7, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. It is not that God cannot judge on his own. Can, can, can God, is, is God capable of judging on his own? So if he's capable of judging on his own, then why do we even have to be involved in the first place? Because if we are resurrected or we are translated and we happen to be reigning with the Lord for a thousand years and we happen to look around and we're like, no, wait a minute. Where is so-and-so? Or how come so-and-so uh is not here, or why is that person here, and so on and so forth. These are the questions that we might have, and God, I think, knows that. I think he wants us to know that there may be people that appear to be very pious on the earth. Would you agree? People look very spiritual sometimes. You can, I mean, anybody can put on a suit and wear a tie, right? Come up in front and speak. Anybody can do that. But what is in their hearts? Because that's the only thing that God is going to base his decision on, is what is in your heart. Are you, are, you a, are you worthy to receive righteousness based on your relationship? And by the way, in, in the context of worthiness, the only one that is worthy is Christ himself. Okay, But when we are, when we are living for Christ, and Christ is in us, then his righteousness is transferred to us. Now, sometimes that's a very incomprehensible thing to understand, 
but I just want to let you know that there might be questions that people have when they, when they don't see people that they thought they should see. And so it's just a natural question. So God's going to open up the record books. He's going to say, hey, I want you all to take a look at this. And as we start looking at the record books, we're going to see how he has dealt with everybody in a very fair, unconditional way. He's given everybody the same opportunity. He's given everybody the same uh, privilege of being able to say yes or to say no. He's given everybody what he gave Satan in heaven and what he gave Adam and Eve here on earth, and that is the freedom of choice. So let's go ahead and read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. The Lord will consume them with the breath of his mouth and destroy them with the brightness of his coming. Now, who do you think that's referring to? Is that referring to the righteous folks? The ones that were living or the ones that were resurrected? Or is this another group of people? See, there's only two groups of people at the end of time. You have the righteous and you have the wicked. You're either in this camp or you're in this camp. There is no in-between. Well, we're going to get to that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build the suspense, Brian. Is it working? <laughs> okay, so uh, the, uh, it, it, is, it, it will be humanly impossible for the lost to survive the presence of Jesus. Now, you remember when Moses was up on the mountain, right? How was the only way that Moses, and by the way, would you consider of all the people that we read about in the Old Testament, Moses was probably one of the guys on the top 10 list of righteous folks, right? He wasn't even allowed to see God. Why? Because the brightness of his glory would have slain him as well. And by the way, when the angel came to Jesus' tomb, this was only one angel with the brightness of glory on him. And it made, uh, it made soldiers fall down like dead men. Just one angel. Can you imagine the glory of God or Jesus himself? So I want you to think about that. If, if you're not with Jesus, you better think about getting with him. Because that's the only way you're going to survive when he comes back. Um, and by the way, I'm not, let me, let me back up a second, because even more important than surviving when he comes back, we need to know how to live now, because if we live the way we're supposed to live now, we will know how, he, how we are going to live when he comes to get us. So at the second coming of Christ, the righteous are resurrected and transla uh, translated to meet Jesus in the clouds. But we read this in Jeremiah 25, 33, and it says, And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth until the other end of the earth. Where does it say the slain are going to be? They're going to be laying everywhere. Now, who's going to bury them? There's nobody to bury them. Everybody's dead. Either, either you're resurrected or you're slain or still in the grave. So where does your body remain during this thousand year period that we're going to talk about here in just a moment. Right where you die, that's where you stay. And, it, and, and without getting too gruesome, it tells us that the birds of the air will actually come and devour the flesh off of our body. Just like you do when you're driving down the road and you see a dead deer, you see vultures out there, that's exactly the same thing that's going to happen to the unrighteous people when they are slain by the brightness of Jesus coming. Now, we're not to be scared about that, but we are to warn our brothers and sisters who are not with the Lord right now. And, and by the way, I, I don't ever use texts like this to say, look, if you don't get yourself right with the Lord, the birds are kind of going to eat you up. That is not the right approach. But what you do is you say, look, God has given us all an opportunity to make a decision. I would like to encourage you to make the right decision to follow Jesus, because when you do, he is going to reward you with eternal life, which means that when he comes back, we are going with him. But those people who choose not to follow him for whatever reason, just know that they are going to die because they are not going to be able to survive the brightness of his coming. 
That's a little bit more palatable way to say the same thing that this says right here. Okay? Hold your thought. Jeremiah 25, 33, they shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. So, going back to the question that was asked a minute ago, what happens to the wicked that are slain by the brightness of his coming? Well, they die exactly where they are, and they become like refuse or trash on the ground. Now, when does it say, or how long does it say they're going to be in that condition? Let's go ahead and see what the Bible says about that, because the Bible, I think, tells us. Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So now let's, let's, uh, let's sort of build the picture because we're, we're coming to the climax here, but I want to I build the picture. So Jesus tells us that he's coming back. He tells us how he's coming back. He says that there is two groups of people that are going to receive a reward when he comes back. Uh, well, actually, the, the one group of people receives a partial reward, and then one group of people receives their full reward. So who are the people that receive their full reward? The dead in Christ or the living righteous? They are resurrected or they are caught up to meet Jesus in the air. It tells us in the last couple slides that we read that the wicked or those who haven't chose Jesus, they are going to be slain. They are going to become as refuse on the ground and they will no longer live until the thousand years is over. So we have righteous living in heaven, it told us earlier that they are going to be participating in some kind of a judgment. We have the wicked dead that are laying on the ground. And we have now the thousand year period. So let's go ahead and talk about what's going on here. So these are the events that the Bible describes as defining the millennium. Number one, or I'm not going to say number one because I'll, I'll miss my numbers or just bulleted so. Jesus will return with all of his holy angels. Next, the dead in Christ will rise in the first resurrection. Now, a lot of these texts, all these texts we've read at one point or another, so I'm not going to read them all again to you. The living saved will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. The redeemed all go home with Jesus and reign with him for a thousand years. The unsaved perish in the presence of Christ at the second coming. The unsaved dead remain dead and are not resurrected until after the thousand years. Satan is bound during the thousand years by a chain of circumstances. There won't be anyone alive on earth to tempt or to destroy. And then finally, the righteous are in heaven and all the wicked are dead. Earth is a, in complete ruins. Remember we go back to the word bottomless pit or abusos or the word that we see in Hebrew which means without form or void or chaotic. That's exactly what the world is going to look like during the thousand year period. So let's go ahead and, and go on and, and build this case just a little bit more. So Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 3 says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the abusos, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So now we have the next part of the story. So we already know what happens at the beginning of the millennium. We know what happens to the wicked. We know what happens to the righteous. We know what is going to be happening in heaven. We know what's happening here on the earth. But there's an additional element that's just been added here, and that it says that Satan will be chained. Now, is he going to be physically, literally chained? Or is he chained by his circumstances? So if you are a tempter, and you've spent the entirety of your existence tempting people, 
and now you have nobody to tempt because they're all dead or they're all gone, are you now not bound by a chain of circumstances? So whatever it is that you created which caused this whole event to take place has brought you to the point now where you have to pay part of your crime. Part, you have to do part of your time for a thousand years to pay for all of the death and destruction that you've accomplished while you've lived here on the earth. But let me ask you something. What is even more drastic than being bound by your circumstances for a thousand years? What do you think is going to happen to Satan at the end of the thousand years? There, something has to happen. We haven't gotten to that yet. We're going to get to it for just a moment. But Satan is imprisoned. The lost are all dead. The saved are all in heaven. Satan wanted to rule this planet. He told everybody, if you follow God, you know, you're not going to be happy with your life. Things are going to be all messed up. You're never going to be able to meet his standards. Uh, therefore, you're just going to be miserable. So you might as well just go ahead and do as thou wilt. Alistair Crowley, you've ever heard of that? Do what you want to do because, you know what, you're going to die anyway and you're just going to go to the ground. And by the way, a lot of people believe that. A lot of people believe that you're just going to go to the ground and that's where you're going to stay forever. Now, there are people that are going to go in the ground, but they're going to come back out of the ground at some point to receive their reward. So God's character of love has been fully revealed. He wants to save the righteous. He wants to save the wicked too. But he saves the righteous by resurrecting them. And then he punishes, he gives partial punishment to the, to the wicked and partial punishment to Satan. So the partial punishment to the wicked is that they die the first death, which is the physical death, right? They don't die the, the eternal death or the spiritual death until after the millennium. And we're going to get to that here in just a moment. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23, it says, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. Now, I shared with you earlier what that means. That word, uh, without form and void, is the same phrase that they use in the Old Testament when it talks about the creation of the world. It just means chaotic and formless and uh, without, you know, without any structure until God spoke and it became right isn't that that's also another interesting thing isn't it have you ever thought about God just speaking something and it becoming taking um taking something that was nothing you know just form and, and void and nothingness and chaos and turning it into something beautiful that existed before sin and by the way, we haven't, this is not part of today's message, but you know, there is a time coming when God is going to bring this earth back to its previous glory. Now, that's a day that I want to see too. How about you? So let's go ahead and continue. Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 24 through 27. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of heaven had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. So, would you agree that during this thousand-year period, it's going to probably look something like it did before God said anything, back during creation? What are Satan and his angels able to do during the thousand-year period? They're not able to do anything. They, I mean, they can't tempt each other. They've, been, they, they, they've sold out for thousands and thousands of years. I mean, who are, what are they going to pull over the next angel, right? I mean, they, they've probably got it all covered. But let's go ahead now and talk about this, uh, this millennium. So we talked about what some of the... Uh, the, the bullet points are of what's going to happen during this whole period of time. But now let's go ahead and talk about some of the text that we just read and what that looks like. The earth is going to be devastated and desolate. 
All of the unsaved are dead. They are slain by the brightness of Jesus coming. All of the saved are in heaven reigning with Christ. Some of this is review, but this is important. Satan is bound on this desolate planet with no one to deceive. Now we go ahead and we read Revelation verses 20, or chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. It says, Now when the thousand years have expired, so now we're at the end of the thousand years, right? So now we need to know what happens at the end of the thousand years. It says, Satan will be released from his prison. Now how is the only way that Satan can be unbound? If he was bound by a chain of circumstances which allowed him to not tempt anybody, what would allow him to be unbound? What would that look like? Now he's going to have people to tempt again, right? Who are those people that he's going to be able to tempt? The righteous are up there. The dead that, the dead that died on the ground and were refuse, and those who were dead when Jesus came, they're going to come up out of the grave and now Satan is going to rally them all together. Because if you remember, there is a period of time when they try to come to the heavenly city and take that over. Okay, So he's going to deceive them one more time. So it says, Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. To gather them together to the battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. Continuing on. Revelation chapter 20 verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And Revelation 20 verse 8, The number as the sand of the sea. So let me break these two texts down for you. So it takes place at the end of the millennium. Um, we know that the wicked are going to be resurrected. Uh, whether they come up out of the ground or whether they just rise up wherever they were laying on the ground. Uh, it will be a vast number of people. Because I, I, would, uh, I, I don't know what that number is going to be. But if you were to just take an educated guess, do you think that there is going to be more righteous in heaven or, more, uh, or, or less righteous in heaven than we have wicked on the earth? My guess is there's probably going to be more wicked on the earth than there are righteous in heaven. Not to say that they couldn't have been righteous. Remember, because what's the what what is the, the the prerequisite for righteousness? You have to accept Jesus Christ. You have to follow his ways. You have to put your trust and confidence in him. You have to confess your sins. You have to turn away from your sins. You have to be forgiven. Right? There are people today who will say, you know what, that's not for me. You can just go tell somebody else about that stuff. And John says that the number of those that are on the earth is as the sands of the sea. Now, how many do you think that is? How many of you all have ever been to the beach? There's a lot of sand out there, isn't there? Let's continue on here. Now, when the thousand years have expired... Satan will be released from his prison and go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, to gather them together to the battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. And by the way, so when this resurrection takes place, Satan is going to rally all them together. He's going to be like the supreme commander. Okay, who's the supreme commander in heaven? Jesus is. Who's the supreme commander on the earth at this time? Satan will be. And so remember when this great controversy began in heaven, who was it between? Christ and Satan. So the final controversy at the end of the time at the end of time is going to be between Christ and Satan. So Satan organizes them into vast armies. He organizes them and he wants to take the new Jerusalem that is coming down from heaven by force. The earth is its last battle. But how will it all end? That's a good question. The next slide tells us how this whole thing ends. And by the way, I'm not trying to minimize what happens next. And it's unfortunate. We've already spoke about it. We've already acknowledged it. But there are going to be people that we love very dearly that are going to be lost. That's just how it is. Maybe family members, 
friends, children, who knows? But we need to continue up until their last breath. They have every opportunity to receive the love of Jesus Christ into their hearts and accept Him as their Lord and Savior. You know that, right? People have every opportunity until the day that they die. I mean, look at the thief on the cross. He was hours from death and accepted Christ. And he asked to have his sins forgiven. We need to all ask for Jesus to forgive us of our sins so that we can be ready, so that we're part of the first group and not the second group. But here's what happens to the second group. After they're raised up off the ground or raised up out of the grave, they go and they rally with Satan to take the new Jerusalem. And God says, you know what? Enough is enough. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, a lot of people say, when this happens, that this must be the hell that's referred to. And by by the way, thank you, Barry, for giving us all of those examples of what hell or grave or all the iterations of those words mean. Because even in some cases, some people believe that the hell that we're going to experience is this burning fire that's going to burn on forever and ever and ever. Now, we already know, based upon what Barry shared with us last week, that um, hell is not necessarily a place. It's more of an event. So what takes place when Jesus comes down in the great city, Satan rises up to take the city, fire and brimstone comes down, creates this lake of fire. And by the way, what did Barry tell, who did Barry tell us is the lake of fire is reserved for? The devil and his angels. Now, now let, it begs the question, right? If, if the lake of fire is reserved for uh, Satan and his angels, Does that mean that God never intended to throw a human being into that lake of fire? That's what it would sound like to me. So what does that mean? Does that mean that everybody that is still living still has the opportunity to make sure they're not taking a swim in the lake of fire? So what a tragic end for those who could have had it so differently. Malachi chapter 4 verse 3. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On that day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Now, if any of you have ever been to a campground and you've had a campfire and you've went in there and you've put the fire out and sometimes you had to stamp it out with your foot or whatever, that's gonna, what it's going to be like after everything on the earth is burned up. Now, how much of the earth is going to be burned up? Everything on the earth and underneath the earth is going to be burned up. The wages of sin has to be, or I mean, uh, I'm sorry, the, the punishment for sin, which is eternal death, has to destroy everything. Everything that's living, everything that was created by a sinful, living human being. And by the way, going back to your question, does the Bible ever say that the wicked will be burning forever, because if they do, wouldn't that mean that they would have eternal life? Well, think about that for a moment. If I am, uh, if, if I go to heaven, I mean, if I go to hell, and I'm a wicked person, and that's where I'm roaming around for eternity while I'm being chased around, and by the way, isn't it sort of funny how the image that we get about what hell really looks like is this this guy with horns and a pitchfork chasing everybody around with flames of fire going up everywhere. That, that's pretty childish, isn't it? Because in reality, what's going to happen is when, when you actually go into the lake of fire, you're going to burn up like a piece of wood. And when that piece of wood is gone, what, what happens to the fire? It goes out because there's nothing else to burn up. So when the earth is consumed with fire, how long will the fire burn? Until everything's consumed. Do we, do we know, do we have an example of that in Scripture? We're going to get to that here in a second. Yeah, we're going to read that here. Let me just um, read a couple more verses here. 
Mark chapter 9, verse 45 says, And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. That's not literal. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Barry talked about this last week too. What does it mean for the fire to never be quenched? That we, we cannot put it out. Only God himself can put it out. So the expression is similar to how we might describe a house fire so ferocious that the only people that can put that fire out is the fire department. I can't get a hose. I can't get my little fire extinguisher out. That house is going to burn and burn and burn and burn until the fire department comes in and puts it out. It's not that we think the house is going to burn forever, but we understand that the fire will consume everything before it burns itself out. So the word forever means that it will last until it's no longer there. Do you understand that? So when it says forever, now, in, sometimes in the scripture, forever means you know, either a long period of time, uh, or it says that the righteous will reign forever with Jesus. That is a literal forever. But when it talks about judgment, and it talks about forever, there's only a couple things that are forever. There's a forever as in the righteous will live forever. The wicked will for, forever, uh, no longer forever, uh, or they, they will have forever condemnation or eternal judgment, and then they will be burned up um, until they are consumed. So there's a couple definitions for the word forever. So we just need to understand how it's used and where it's used. Jeremiah 17, 27 says, Then will I kindle a fire in its gates, and I shall devour the places, palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. This is an example of the unquenchable fire. And then we also know that um, if the Bible really meant that people that were going to be burning up or the earth that was going to burn up was going to burn forever, wouldn't Sodom and Gomorrah still be burning? But what does it say here in Jude 7? Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange, strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. What is eternal about the fire? What is eternal about the fire is that it destroys whatever it is consuming. Therefore, it is never to exist again, which makes the destruction of that by the fire eternal. Do we understand that? Okay. So let's go ahead and continue. In Revelation 14, 11, it says, And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Now, we, we've already talked about this last week, where there's no possible way that this could actually mean that people are going to burn forever and ever and ever, and the smoke is just going to ascend. Because we read a text earlier that says that they're going to be ashes under the soles of our feet. We already know from Sodom and Gomorrah that Sodom and Gomorrah is no longer burning, so whatever God uh, wanted to do with that city, it, it, it worked its purpose when the fire came down and destroyed the city because it's no longer burning. I can guarantee you that you can go to where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be, and it is not burning today. Okay? So, um, does this verse, though, contradict the others that speak about the annihilation of the wicked? Now, by the way, um, sometimes people who believe what the Bible says about the destruction of the wicked, we are called a name that maybe you've never heard before, but it's the word an annihilationist. Have you ever heard of that? If you've never been called an annihilationist before, just know that the reason that you will be called that is because most Christians today do not believe that God will destroy that which he has created because of grace. Everybody is saved by grace according to the, the, the most recent um, Christian beliefs that are out there. But, but what do we know about how grace works? We know that it is the power for us to overcome sin so that we can be forgiven, 
so that God will find us righteous, so that he will resurrect us from the grave or call us up to him in the air so that we can then sit in thrones, uh, uh, judgment seats, and we can reign with him for a thousand years while we look over the books of those who are wicked. So we need to understand that um, he loves each and every one of us, and he doesn't do anything arbitrarily just because he's doing it for kicks. Deuteronomy 15, verse 16 and 17, I will not go, I will not go away from you because he loves you and your house since he prospers you with then you shall take an all. Oh, this is okay. And then you shall thrust it through his ear uh, to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. This is just another example of the word forever. So, in this story right here, this was talking about the rules uh, regarding uh, servants, people who were were like slaves in your house, and they were made a servant. And there was there was like a whole list of requirements that. If they came in a certain way, if they were married a certain way, if their, if their wife or their kids were um, given to you by the master or they came in, on their, came in with them, uh, without explaining all that, it basically boiled down to that if the servant wanted to stay with his master forever, in other words, not leave him, then the way that he would uh, affirm that would be by putting his ear on the doorpost and taking an awl and punching a hole in his ear, which signified that he would now be forever a servant of his master. Not because he was being forced to anymore, but because he has chosen to do that. Now, let's think about this for a minute. Um, how many of you would like to see a scene like that someday? You know, the whole reason for these meetings is because we want you to be prepared to be a part of that. You know, um, and, and by the way, I know that God has got so many good things planned for us. It's even hard to fathom all of the good things that he has. Um, and, and we need to understand that God is not in the business of perpetually torturing people. The purpose for the millennial period is... Number one, it's, 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 earmarked, it's bookmarked by those two resurrections, which I shared with you already. And what happens in between those two resurrections is God vindicates his character by opening up or giving you different lenses to look through and says, look, I want to show you through transparency that I am a God who cared for everybody. I am a God who, who wanted to give everybody the same chance the same opportunity to accept me and not accept the world and Satan and everything that he had to offer. I don't want to burn anybody up. Do you know that when, and Barry shared this last week too, do you know that when, when, um, when God does that, it's called a strange act. It's not something that, that he wants to do, but it's something that he has to do. Because if sin is not destroyed, then what happens to sin? It continues to live on. Right? So this is why we have these sequence of events that take place because um, in Revelation 20, verses 10 through 15, it says, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the, this is the death that we don't want to be a part of right here, the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This leads me to one final point before we draw this to a close. And that is, if it says, for anyone not written, found written in the book of life, what does that imply? Does that imply that your name can be taken out of the book of life? If it says that your name may not be found there, when it says that when we, um, you know, when we go through the whole process of accepting our Lord and Savior and you know, we, are, we ask for forgiveness and we're forgiven and we're walking in a different direction, we're living a different life, it says that our names are written in the book of life. Is it possible that our names can be unwritten 
from the book of life. This text here seems to indicate that, right? And anyone not found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. So, if we go back to our millennium, those who are righteous that are in the ground and those who are living that go up in the air, were they found written in the book of life? They would have had to have been, right? What about the ones that were slain by the brightness of Jesus coming or those who are still in the ground when Jesus comes back after the millennium? Would their names, could their names have been in the book of life and at some point have been taken out? Yes. Or maybe they never made it there in the first place. Let me, let me read for you from Ezekiel here, verse 20, chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. And then 2 Peter Chapter 3, verse 10, the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So, let's recap. We have the righteous who are going to be raised, whether they're dead or whether they're alive. We have this, the wicked that are going to be slain. They're going to lay as refuse on the ground or they're going to still be in the grave. We have a thousand year period where Satan is what? He is bound by a chain of circumstances. In other words, he's got nobody to tempt for a thousand years. The righteous are going to be in heaven. They are going to be looking at the books of those who didn't make it. And they are going to be, they are going to be able to see that God himself is vindicated. That he was just and true and honest and transparent in all that he did. At the end of that millennium, we see that Satan is going to raise all those wicked people back to life. They are going to rise up against the city of God. They're going to try to overtake the city. Fire and brimstone is going to come down and destroy every single one of them. Satan and his cronies are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Uh, Hades, um, uh, I wanted to read it for you, but I lost it. Death and Hades is going to be cast in there as well. And everything is going to be burned up. And when it is all burned up, and the earth is all purified by fire, then guess what God does at that point? He makes everything brand new. Amen. It makes standing up here talking for an hour all worth it when you can end with a statement like that. He makes everything brand new. Satan and his angels, sinners, and even sin will be finally destroyed. Now, I hope that none of you are excited about that. Now, I am, I am happy that God knows what he's doing, but I'm not excited for the fact that there's going to be lots of people who are going to miss it. They're not going to know, or they're going to know, and they're going to choose not to know, or they just are just, they're, they're just not going to accept what God has got to offer them. And they are going to be burned up. And I guarantee you that it's going to be a day like this for everybody when evil is finally destroyed because there is going to be people that we thought were probably going to make it. And there's going to be people there that we're seeing that we thought would have never made it. But hallelujah, God knows better than we do right? He's got everything written down. And he's going to ask you and I to come and join him while he spreads this whole smorgasbord of evidence out. And he says, look, I want you to take your time for a thousand years, and I just want you to come and look at this as often as you want. And I want you to know that what I did, I did because I was asked to do it by the people who chose to live their life that way. But then we read this. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. 
There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And one day, that's going to be us. You can just put your face on, on that right there. But you know what? Wouldn't it be nice for every day for the rest of our life, our face can have that countenance right there? I mean, we were just talking before the, the program tonight. Just the amount of things that happened just in the last few weeks. Imagine a lifetime's worth of stuff. There is a lot of pain and suffering. And God's got a way to fix all of that. He wants all of us to accept Him and His righteousness. However, if we choose to not accept the Lord, then we will also have to take part in what he has reserved for the wicked, for Satan, and for his angels. And so I, I, have, I, I just, I'm going to just put the next picture on here real quick. I, um, I'm not going to make, make an appeal where you all have to come up or anything, but I am sure that there are people that you know in your family your friends, your co-workers, whatever it is in your circle, your sphere of influence, I'm sure that there are people that you know who are just as hard-headed as this piece of wood right here. And they won't listen. And it doesn't matter what you show them in the Bible. They're looking at you like you are like the dumbest thing that's walked the earth. And you know what? Some of you really are taken back by that. I am. I'm the only one in my family who God's been able to break through with this, this truth. The only one. And there might be more of you out there. But you know what God wants for everybody? He wants us all to believe in Him. Remember, it says, all who believe shall be saved. What does the word believe mean? To put our trust and confidence in him. I'm sorry. To believe means, I said that again, I said that backwards earlier too. To believe means to accept something as true. And when I believe or I accept something as true, then I have faith. I, I need to be rebuked because I did that the last time I tried to do this illustration. When I have faith, then I am saying that I put my trust and confidence in that which I accept to be true. So if I accept Jesus Christ to be true, if I accept the things that he teaches to be true, if I accept everything in verity from front page to back page of the Bible to be true, then I must put my trust and confidence in all of that. And by the way, if I put my trust and confidence in all of that, does it leave room for worldviews that are inconsistent with what the Bible teaches? It doesn't leave any room for anything that is man-made. Because we already know that if we follow man-made traditions or man-made ideas, or we fall into the trap of dispensationalism, and it tells us that Jesus is going to come back and set up a a, a reign on earth that's going to bring thousand years of peace before judgment ever comes, you already know that that's a lie. Because we know that before that thousand years comes, we know what's happening. It told us right in the scripture. What happens at the beginning of that thousand years? Jesus Christ comes and he resurrects the righteous. So if you don't see some righteous folks floating off in the sky, you, you know that you, you believe the wrong thing about the millennium. I mean, who, who, who thinks anyway that, that we have the, the, the strength or, or whatever it takes to usher in a thousand years of peace on our own? I mean, how long have we been living on this planet and we still haven't been able to live in peace? What makes you think we're going to be able to do it like for a thousand years like coming up? So anyway, back to my, uh, my sort of appeal. I, I just want to, if you don't mind just kneeling where you are, if, if you have some people on your heart right now, specifically people on your heart, that you want to pray for, that God will reach them in a way that they will give their lives to him, 
that they will accept the truth that is found in Scripture, that they will not be counted as part of the wicked, but they will be counted as part of the righteous, let's bow right now. Let's put, be, go on our knees and pray for those people. I'm going to have a 30-second moment of silence, and then I'm going to have a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, there are people in our hearts right now that we know are not walking with you intentionally because the life that they're living right now is too good for them. And Lord, I'm not asking you to make things bad for them so that they'll change their mind. What I'm asking you for is that you will present an opportunity that you did for the rich young ruler. And even though the rich young ruler turned and walked the other way, they were presented with a face-to-face -face opportunity to choose whom they would serve. Lord, I know that not, you know, none of us in this room are of any stature or of any spiritual condition that we are better than anybody else. But Lord, we care deeply, not only for our friends and our family and our loved ones and our co-workers and so on and so forth, but Lord, we even care for those people who consider us to be their enemy. The people that don't like us for whatever reason. We want you to bless them too. Because, Lord, I don't want to be one of those people at the end of the millennium who will be shedding tears because I will be seeing the wicked burning up. And, Lord, I want to be a part of that resurrection when you come back the second time. Like I'm sure everybody in this room is and those who are listening. So I pray that you will please get our hearts ready. Help us to live our lives uh, that... That, that reflects that we know that you are coming back. Because the worst thing that could possibly happen is that we can say that we, that we believe you and we have faith in you, and then we live like we don't even know that you're coming. Lord, we know that you have reserved judgment for the devil and his angels, and for death and Hades. But Lord, please save as many as you can before you come. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.